Welcome to CW Jaw Talk number 22, where today we're going to discuss three ways that I have found to be effective in dealing with people that at one time or another I was concerned about in the sense that I felt they were part of a cult or that I was once a part of a group that may have been like a cult. And why do I say cult and like a cult? What's the difference? But nonetheless, we'll get to it in, in dealing with people whom I at one time thought of as either part of a group or affected by a group that is a cult or like a cult religiously. That is, they have a, an unusual devotion that we'll discuss further to something other than what is basically accepted as a normal religious figure. And, and even that gets involved in, in a judgment of a sort because ultimately you could even have someone who is devoted to one who's considered basically an accepted religious figure, let's say someone like Jesus, but others who do not believe in Jesus would consider those who do part of a cult. So, you know, where do we draw the line and how do we deal with people we believe are in a cult? while at the same time, we're a part of a group that other people believe is a cult. This is often what we find ourselves dealing with because I don't think I'm part of a cult or in a cult. And yet I discuss things with people on an almost daily basis whom I believe are involved with a group that is a cult or like a cult in the sense that, as I mentioned, their devotion is not to a normally accepted religious figure. And now, let me discuss a little bit more what I mean by normally accepted. Okay, so when we talk about someone like Jesus, I'm going to use him as an example because he's the one I'm devoted to in the sense that I think other people who aren't would view me as part of a cult. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about it in that, from that perspective of being in that devoted uh, mindset and thought. And then why I see others as different. Okay, well, with Jesus, the reason I'm devoted to him in the ways that I am are because of the evidence that I've come to learn about over time that points to him as a certain figure in ways unusual and even unique to him. That is, nobody else shares the reasons that make him so special. That doesn't mean there aren't other figures that don't have similar stories or histories or evidence that might make them unique as well. What I'm saying is that when it comes to Jesus and many other people, the reason we're devoted to him is because of the things that he did. And then the question becomes, one, okay, did he really do those things? And number two, what's the significance of what he did? Why is that so important? so as to require or cause devotion of the sort that I and other people have to where, you know, we will give our life on, on his behalf. At least we believe we will, right? Uh, even in the Christian accounts, you have people like Peter who vehemently stated uh, and probably genuinely believed that he would defend Jesus to the end. And yet at the end, he denied him three times. But that didn't change what ultimately happened to him. Not in the sense that it didn't mean Peter had a problem that couldn't be solved, at least not in terms of what Jesus saw in him, because he went on to do a lot of good things even though he had problems. Okay, so people like Peter, who in these records was you know, described in these ways, and other people like Paul, who interacted and even confronted Peter about issues, things that they were doing right or wrong, so these kinds of people became devoted to Jesus because they either saw him like Peter or experienced him like Paul in a way and also learned about him and connected from the Hebrew texts, writings, uh, things from writings like from Moses and from the Psalms of David and other texts, the book of Isaiah, that spoke about one who would be sent by God. Okay, so it, it rises Jesus like other religious figures 
rises all the way up to the closest association you can have with the divine. Okay, and I'm not going to get into the uh, proof of the divine right now. I've talked about existence of God and eternal life that's intelligent before. My point is, why do we make a distinction between groups who may be devoted to people other than, say, Jesus, but who ultimately, through their belief in other people, are believing or think they're believing in Jesus, and those who don't believe in other um, individuals but who believe directly in Jesus as the one through whom they can reach God. Okay, so people who don't believe in Jesus but who may believe in the same biblical God, like certain Jewish uh, people, would say, well, you're just in a cult of Jesus. You know, you're, you're following this person whom we believe was rightly put to death um, for ins insurrection, whatever the reasons they believe would be correct. And so we believe that you're not you're, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible correct. You're not worshiping the God of Moses correctly. You're, you're worshiping this other human who was killed like a criminal. And, that, and then, as I said earlier, people like me who do believe in Jesus and who don't believe he was a criminal, but he was just killed as if he was one. Like the prophecies written Isaiah said would be so. So, we believe in him for ways that, for reasons that other people don't accept, like, like Jews and others. But nonetheless, we still, in their view, have this cultic devotion. And in our view, other groups, certain um, Christian groups who have devotion to individuals other than Jesus, we look at in our devotion to Jesus and say, that group's a cult, that group's like a cult. And, and why, you know, why is it like a cult and not a cult? Well, you know, again, I, as I will discuss further, it has a lot to do with whether or not a group is correct and the source of their devotion. Because even though it might be said by certain people like certain um, um, Jesus-believing Jews that Christians are in a cult, the fact is we are pointing to things. And I have a whole series going right now. I'm, not, I'm just in the middle of it. I've done six parts. I've got a lot more ready that provide evidence from before Jesus was born that are unusual, that are part of a long line of writings and discussions and events that can be uh, isolated, identified, like the Tower of Babel, the Flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the rivers that are mentioned in relation to the Garden of Eden, all these unusual events and things people like Jesus come in the middle of. And he's the main one. So our devotion to him and the devotion of Christians to him, although maybe seen similarly by, as I said, certain non-Jesus believing Jews and others, our devotion to him in one sense may be similar to all kinds of cultic groups. It just depends on who's looking at whom. But more, more often than not, it's, it's the case that groups other than those who are devoted directly to figures like Jesus because of the unusual nature of the evidence or at least the, the things that are cited in connection with him are unusual even from the perspective of people who don't accept him as the Messiah so that they're not, they're not seen as the same usually when it comes to belief in other people. Um, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll just use one name, David Koresh, an individual who claims special appointment by God in a way that I'm not going to get into extensively. I'm just mentioning him as an example. He doesn't have the body of evidence. He doesn't come in the line of texts, even though he may have applied certain things as he did uh, to himself. That's a whole different thing than a, a long history of thousands of years of people from Abraham, a very well-known figure from a place, a city, named Ur, that was in the last 100 to 200 years discovered, but yet these texts accurately explained and cited in association with these figures that then provide a lineage to people like Jacob, Isaac, and those who became, uh, through their offspring, enslaved in Egypt, and who were then freed by Moses 
to whom these laws were given that spoke about Jesus. There's all this history, ongoing discussion and belief, major figures along the way carrying these texts, going through these things, looking to this hope, worshiping this God. So there's just a lot more going on that validates in the minds of many the kind of devotion that people like me try to show directly to Jesus or to the one he worshipped as, as his father, Jah, Jahuwah, the God of the Bible. Okay, so that's often why that's seen as, there's, groups are seen as different. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, a group like um, um, a certain evangelical Trinitarian group wouldn't see me or, or the Christian witnesses of Jah as a cult. But it, they'd have to show that there's some kind of devotion to something other than what they already are, to whom they're devoted to. And they would say, well, it's the difference in your point of view, right? You're not Trinitarian. So you're, <laughs> you're a cult in the sense that you, are, you have a, a, an errant view of the same thing or person to whom we're devoted. And so, and that is a sense in which, you know, terms like sect, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, came to have, they didn't have it in the original biblical sense, right? Because in texts like Acts 5.17, it refers to the high priest and those with him, the sect, high racis, of the Pharisees. Let me share the definition of that term with you. This is from the uh, Bauer, Danker, Art and Gingrich lexicon, page 27. And so there's a term in the, for example, the text that I referenced, Acts 5.17, high racis. And so on pages 27 and 28, notice how, how this lexicon defines this term, which is used of a, of a group associated with the high priest at that time. So the reference is by the, the writer of Acts to those who were with the high priest. And so he's not really referring to them in a cultic sense necessary, unless he was in the sense they were devoted to that priestly system apart from Jah, it's hard to say. But if they were just viewing it as a faction, you know, of different party, of the official group, of, 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 or of, a party of the, of the official groups, accepted groups of Jews who were practicing at that time. So that's why in this lexicon, it gives a couple de uh, definitions based on the time and the opinion that people had of different groups. So in Acts 5.17, it does not appear to me that hieresis is being used in a cultic or even heretical sense, because as again, as I said, it's referring to the chief priest and those with him being of the faction or hieresis of the Sadducees. It's not referring to them in a come down, it's just describing who was there, the faction of this group. So not necessarily in a cultic or heretical sense, especially since this is the minority group writing, right? The Christians, they would have been considered the, her the heretics by the Jews at that time, at least if they understood hieresis in the, the Greek sense of uh, being a heretic. So in this lexicon, it says a, that hieresis can refer to a group that holds tenets distinctive to it, sect, party, school, faction, the school of Dionysus, of the Sadducees. It refers to Acts 5.17, the text I just referred to as well. And then it refers to text of referring where high racis is used of the Christians, the sect of the Nazarenes, the high racis ton Nazorion, a party of the Nazarenes. So, and then it says in a later sense, heretical sect. And then it refers to, for example, the writings of Irenaeus and Origen. That which distinguishes a group's thinking opinion, dogma. And it says, with negative connotation, dissension of faction. And then it cites Galatians 5.20, 1 Corinthians 11.19. And so we do know that at the time of the New Testament, that there were individuals that the Bible writers cite out as those drawing people after them, right? Now, it may be that the others were saying the same about the Bible writers. 
The point is, who were the Bible writers saying to follow? Were the Bible writers saying to follow them? No. I mean, Paul over and over again said, who am I? Who is Apollos? We're nothing. We plant, we water, God makes it grow. They were always deferring in the accepted biblical texts to the Christ, to the one they accepted. And they were trying to get people to do the same. But there were others, even during the biblical times, that were not doing those things. The text I just quoted from Galatians or referenced and 1 Corinthians. And the people who are singled out in the biblical writings at times as those who are drawing people away. So you had people drawing others away, and you had people like Paul and others pointing to the Christ. So there's a difference there in terms of how they're presenting their teachings, right? Their teachings are pretty much, listen to this person. <laughs> you should follow this one. And then they, they, they do their best to help you and to discuss the issues common to those in the different areas uh, where Christians existed. So there's just a different feel overall, I believe, in the New Testament text. Paul in Romans says we all stand before God. Who are we to be judging other people? And what did Jesus say in Matthew 7? You're not to be judging other people. So the whole, I'm talking about the Christian religion. Because remember, you know, if we're if there's no real difference but perspective, right? If If we're a cult, those who are devoted to Jesus because of that devotion, and in the perspective of non-Jesus believing Jews, that makes us a cult. Well, then what? What is the what is the difference? What's the point, right? Of 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 us going through this exercise of they're calling us a cult, we're calling them. Everyone's in a cult, right? Except, except maybe those who only believe in God and don't accept anyone else as having come as His official agent yet. That'd be the only way you could really get out of that. And then it's not even that simple as as we'll show in just a moment. Because it can be more than just human devotion. Let me get into a little bit more of what a cult is. And I've tried to do that so far by using my own religion as an example. Because I believe that's the best way for us to handle other people. Right? We first got to look at ourselves. Right? How are other people viewing us? Why are we different? And then do we still have the basis for saying to other people... Yeah, no, I'm okay, we're okay, but but you're you may have some issues. And then how do we do that? If we're okay, we start with ourselves, we identify why we're not in the same, you know, we don't have a rafter in our eye, right? Like Jesus said. And while we're trying to get the little splinter out of other people's eyes, how do we, we start there and then, then we'll get to other people once we're clear, and then what's the best ways to go from there? Let's share this article together. I think you'll find this interesting. I'll put it up. I'll, I'll put the link, I should say. So, you know, I and this is from uh, Tara Isabella Burton down here. She's a writer about religion, culture, places, and her work has appeared in National Geographic, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, among others. She's a Clarendon scholar at Trinity College, Oxford, working on a doctorate in theology and recently completed her first novel. Okay, so as we know, we, we, we appreciate that people are accomplished and tell us something about you know, their experience, but we never just accept people because of what they claim to be or where they've learned. You know, if, they don't, if they haven't learned the right information and how to present it to other people, well, what good is it, right? What's the point? So we look for the information, but it's good to know a little bit about um, the writer. So let's take a look. This is from um, the Aeon newsletter. And I uh, just read to you a little bit about the author. Excuse me. All right, we'll be doing a little reading, so I'll make sure I'm ready. Let's just share a few parts of this article together. I'll read most of it, but not all of it, because some parts are just, you know, we don't need every single section. I'll put a link below, though. And even though I'm going to read a lot of this article, that doesn't mean I agree or accept or, or ratify every single thing I'm reading. Excuse me. What it means is I'm going to be reading things I want you to think about in terms of what is a cult and what's cult like. 
Because once we answer that question fully or further in the sense that we'll have the understanding necessary to help other people, that's when I'm going to give you the three ways, okay? Don't worry, I won't make you wait forever. <laughs> and I think you will like, you'll, you'll be able to relate to and use the three ways um, effectively. But not until this, not until we get a little more perspective on what a cult is. All right, let, let's read a little bit together. And I'll talk at times um, about parts of it. Cults, generally speaking, are a lot like pornography. You know them when you see them. Although I don't think that's necessarily the case. It depends on your view of pornography. But still, again, okay, you know, not everything. We don't need to agree with every single thing, I think, in order to get the, um, the perspective of this person, which is interesting. And for the most part, I agree, perspectively. So let's keep going. It would be hard, she says, it would be hard to avoid the label on encountering, as I did carrying out field work last year, 20 people toiling unpaid on a Christian farming compound in rural Wisconsin, people who are venerate, who venerated their leader as the closest thing to God's representative on earth. Of course, they, they notice it's in the italics, they argued vehemently that they were not a cult. Ditto for the 2,000 member church I visited outside Nashville, whose parishioners had been convinced by an ostensibly Christian diet program to sell their houses and move to one square mile of the New Jerusalem promised by their charismatic church leader. Here, they would eat, live in accordance with God and their leader's commands. It's easy enough as an outsider to say instinctively, yes, this is a cult, right? I mean, so the, the example she gave, you're thinking of those while I'm reading it and you're like, okay, yeah, that's a little unusual. Okay, well, let's go a little further though. Less easy though is identifying why. Remember how we started out this show. Why are we not a cult? Why are those who believe in Jesus are devoted to him, not a cult, but other people who have a devotion to him, but through other people are a cult? Why, why, why the difference? Knee-jerk reactions make for poor sociology and delineating what exactly makes a cult as opposed to a proper religious movement often comes down to judgment calls based on perceived legitimacy, right? Remember we talked about earlier, it's really a question of, are you correct? Prod that perception of legitimacy, however, and you find value judgments based on age, tradition, or respectability. That nice middle-class couple down the street say, as opposed to Tom Cruise, jumping up and down on a couch. Okay, well, I mean, I think we could still perceive some degree of legitimacy between those actions, but nonetheless, I think her point is still valid, maybe not necessarily there, but the markers of cultism as applied more theoretically, a single charismatic leader, an insular structure, seeming religious ecstasy, a financial burden on members, can also be applied to any number of new, or burgeoning religious movements that we don't call cults. Okay, so, all right, what do we do now? Is it just nothing? Or do we not help anyone because we could all be one? <laughs> well, that is someone in need of help from someone? Well, maybe, but let's go a little further with it. Okay, so let's share this paragraph here because she comments on a few things. Actually, I'm going to read at least... What is it here? Uh, right. These three paragraphs I'm going to read from here to here, and then we're going to talk. Okay, so let's share this together. She covers a lot here. And she mentions people like Martin, uh, uh, Walter Martin and others. So um, it's important that we read this together, I think, to at least advance some of our discussion about the difference between those we see as cults and the cult that people may see us as being in. Historically, our obsession with cults seems to thrive in periods of wider religious uncertainty with anti-cult activism in the United States peaking in the 1960s and 70s, when the U.S. religious landscape was growing more diverse and the sway of traditional institutions of religious power was eroding. 
This period, dubbed by the economic historian Robert Fogel as the Fourth Great Awakening, saw interest in personal, spiritual, and religious practice spike alongside a decline in mainline Protestantism, giving rise to numerous new movements. Some of these were Christian in nature, for example, the Jesus Movement. Others were heavily influenced by the pop culture, cultural ubiquity of pseudo-Eastern and New Age thought, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, a.k.a. the Hare Krishna, Modern Wicca, Scientology. Plenty of these movements were associated with young people, especially young countercultural people with suspicious politics, adding a particular political te tenor to the discourse surrounding them. Okay, two more paragraphs. Against these sprang a network of anti-cult movements uniting former members of sects, their families, and other objectors. Institutions such as the Cult Awareness Network, CAN, formed in 1978 after the poison fruit drink, urban legend says Kool-Aid, suicides of Jim, Jim Jones and his People's Temple. The anti-cult networks believe that cults brainwash their members. The idea of mind control, as scholars such as Margaret Singer point out, originated in media coverage of torture techniques supposedly used by North Korea during the Korean War. To counter brainwashing, activists controversially abducted and forcibly deprogrammed members who'd fallen under a cult sway. CAN itself was co-founded by a professional deprogrammer, Ted Patrick, who later faced scrutiny for accepting $27,000 from the concerned parents of a woman involved in leftist politics, essentially handcuffed to her bed for two weeks. Do not take that programming, deprogramming session. But that wasn't all. An equal and no less fervent network of what became known as countercult activists emerged among Christians who opposed cults on theological grounds and who were worried or were as worried about the state of adherent souls as of their psyches. The Baptist pastor Walter Ralston Martin was sufficiently disturbed by the proliferation of religious pluralism in the U.S. to write The Kingdom of the Cults, 1965 which delineated in detail the theologies of those religious movements Martin identified as toxic and provided biblical avenues for the enterprising mainstream Christian minister to oppose them. With more than half a million copies sold, it was one of the top-selling spiritual books of the era. Okay, so here you actually see an example of what I was talking about with regard to myself and other people, that is, you have someone who's like Walter Martin, who claims devotion to Jesus apart from any other agent, although there would be people who would take issue and say, well, no, he's actually using the creeds and the councils and the scholarly understanding that reinforces them in place of the biblical text, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm using him as an example the same way I use myself as an example, and that is of someone who sees themselves as devoted to someone who is uniquely worthy of that devotion. In most people's minds, or even in those who aren't devoted to him, there's at least enough accepted difference and deference so that at the time, for example, mainstream Christianity wouldn't have seen Walter Martin as a occultist. They would have seen him as someone like them, devoted to Jesus, fighting against those who are interfering with people in Jesus. Okay, again, we'll set aside whether that's correct or not. I'm just talking about their perspective, right? From Martin's perspective, all these other groups were cults, but he was not, right? Obviously. Same with me. Obviously, I don't believe I'm a part of a cult or I wouldn't be talking about them in the ways that I think you should be aware of so that you can differentiate things, um, whether it's involving people like me or others, and then decide for yourself what's going on. Okay, well, 
that's one way of looking at things that is in terms of different groups whom you could come up with a, a way to describe them as heretical or cultic or overly devoted to a non-normal or unusual figure, someone not as accepted as others like Jesus. Again, even if you don't accept him, the information in history about him generally causes people to not include those devoted to him in a cult, unless you just really disbelieve Jesus or if maybe uh, people who believe in a lot of things associated with Jesus, like Abraham, Moses, so many Jewish believing people, it's easy to see why they would view Christians as a cult. In the way we view uh, as Christians, certain other groups within Christianity as a cult. So it really boils down to, again, whether or not the person is right. That is in either case, right? Perspectively, you could say, um, well, okay, I'm going to use an example now. I'm going to use an example for um, uh, the Watchtower Society because I'm familiar with it. I think you will, if you're at all familiar with the Watchtower Society or Jehovah's Witnesses who are a part of the Watchtower Society, whether you agree with them or not, I believe that you would say there are many people, maybe even most, among those who follow with the Watchtower Society, who are doing so in a way that involves a devotion to people like Jesus and his God. Okay, so where's the problem then? Well, then many, many who don't follow the Watchtower Society, but who also believe in Jesus and his God would say that the, the Watchtower Society's leadership is requiring more than Jesus and God require. And so because of that, we believe it's endangering certain individuals. Now, that may not be the case with many individuals in, the, in some comparative sense, right? So I guess it depends if you see things like the blood issue as endangering pretty much every member of the Watchtower Society, potentially. Then you have to weigh the chances that a person in the Watchtower Society, that is in terms of your concern, the level of your concern, you weigh the, what's the likelihood someone in the society is going to encounter a life-threatening situation to where they'll have to face that question of whether or not to accept a certain medical treatment that may affect their life. It can happen. It does happen. It will happen to some. What's the chances of that versus negative effects coming from someone whom you get out of the society to save them from the blood issue, but now you've put them in a position or in a condition where they have nothing to do? The thing that kept them out of things like maybe crime or different groups and different destructive ways of life, drugs, whatever. Even though there was, there's that danger there, that percentage of danger, we can't deny that in terms of whether or not, if you believe that the... Um, View of the Watchtower Society on blood is a danger, potentially. There's a danger in a lot of things. And so now we get to the point where, okay, so do we risk? If we view the Watchtower Society as a cultic agent, for example, because things they've done that aren't correct and things they teach we may not agree with, right? They don't think that, though. The people in the Watchtower Society, they don't really, they, you don't think they've heard the word cult? <laughs> I heard it all the time when I was more active with them in those ways. I just didn't believe they were in the way I needed to be as worried about to leave. Because, and this is key, this is going to tie in to number one of our three ways. And we're going to get to those in just a few minutes. I'm almost done wrapping things up with this whole discussion of a cult. What is a cult? What's cult like? And how do we view ourselves and others in this way differently? So as to have legitimacy when we talk to other people about being in a cult. Okay, so almost no active member who really is following with the Watchtower Society views them as a cult in the sense they need to worry about enough to leave. Maybe some do and they just feel helpless and so they're just there but they still feel they should leave. There's probably some like that. But most really believe that in spite of the problems, right, in spite of any issues, things that may have happened, they have things 
that are more important. They use the divine name. They actively try to, you know, uh, preach the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom. Now, I'm not going to get in. I'm, I mean, I'll get into it a little bit. I'm not saying that that message isn't um, potentially diluted with error in the sense that they associate a chronology with the kingdom that's um, can be shown to be in error. But nonetheless, that they accept as believable enough because of these other things. You see, oftentimes when we're dealing with people in groups like the society, and I'm going to keep using them because I think I'm using them fairly in the sense that I understand and accept that not everybody who's a part of it is like of the mindset that, hey, I'm in a cult and this is great. It's really more, I want to serve John and follow Jesus. I, I see there's some problems. I hear what people are saying. I see the signs. I read, but all these other things are so great. We have the divine name. No one else is really using that or they make an issue out of it. And we're, we're using it like no one else. I'm giving you their perspective. And in some ways, I agree with them, on, at least in terms of their uniqueness comparatively. It doesn't mean they're better or that they're more legitimate. It just means there's uniqueness in some of the things they do. They have a greater sense of unity, or at least they, they advocated, and I think sharing it, at least when I was there, it felt that way. I didn't feel like there was a um, sense of racism or issues involving um, ethnic ish problems. That wasn't really an, a, a, a cultivated thing there, ever. I'm not saying it was never an issue. I'm just saying I never felt it there. So there are things that keep people going. Now you combine that with family ties, businesses. You could talk about the Mormons, right? I'm using a couple groups because they're often viewed and labeled as a cult. And certainly Martin would call them a cult. And whether I would call them a cult or not, we'll talk about in a moment. But there are groups, there are people within these groups that even if they are in a cult, it's just not as cut and dry all the time Either in comparative terms, that is, the devotion that you and I have, it can be shown to be different. But my point is, they think they are devoted to the same things. It's like with a Trinitarian, remember? And they see people like me. Yeah, I'm devoted to Jesus and, and Jesus God, but not the Trinity. Cult. Heretical. So, it's a, in that sense, it becomes a question of who's right, right? If I'm right, then I'm not, not in a cult. If they're right, I am in a cult. But whether I know I'm in a cult or not is really not for them to say, right? I mean, I've obviously studied these things enough and they could say, well, obviously you see, so your sin remains if they think I'm wrong. But I could say the same thing for them and I do because I think they're wrong and I think some of them know it and certainly those who are apologetically driven to interfere with others and show that they know it, and well, they're just following the same steps that those who oppose Jesus follow. It doesn't mean that everyone who doesn't agree with Jesus is someone like that. But there are some who are very opposing, follow people around, and do nothing but cause trouble, right? And so they've convinced themselves that you are a problem. You're in a cult, and they have to stop you. And they may really believe it, right? What did Jesus say? The, the hour will come when people will put you to death, but they think they're serving God. So it's not even always, if if, you, if most of the time, a question of intent, <laughs> They may, and most people I think do, genuinely believe they're doing the right thing. All right, so that's where the difficulty comes into play. We don't all agree. Some of us think we're in a cult. Some of us think others are in a cult, but we're not in a cult. We have better evidence. Our evidence is more unique. We believe it in terms of Jesus. Groups like the Watchtower accept Jesus, but they believe they have unique features and facts, right? Even their prophecies, they've historically believed, for example, the Watchtower, that the, the war in 1914 and subsequent events justified their appointment as this body of authority that can decide certain things like uses of blood, celebrating certain days or not. And if you don't agree with them, you are there are consequences. Okay, so... That's where the issue then gets in, right? Are they correct? It goes back to the same thing. Are, you know, the only real way that you can decide whether someone's really in a cult or not is to convince yourself first whether or not you're in one and why. Okay, if you're not in one, why? 
Well, if the why is because you're correct, because your evidence is obvious, you've looked at it, you've shown it, you've shared it, you've listened to criticisms, and it that's evidence like we would use for anything else. We have it. We're not lying to ourselves. We're not suppressing anything. This is what we have. This is what we believe. It connects. Okay, if that's our standard, and it is for me, then that's what we should use for everything else. When you do that, you won't have any problems, right? You wouldn't have any issues then because they're not. Cor- it wouldn't be correct to say that some of the things that, the, for example, the Watchtower Society required people to believe in the past were correct because they've changed them. So the point is the evidence isn't there. Right? I'm not believing in Jesus or devoted to him because some things are correct about him and other things are incorrect. You see what I'm saying? It's not like, you know, I have a a, a bunch of incorrects and and some corrects and my corrects are more than the incorrects. There's no incorrects. What's incorrect? What fact? What thing could you point to and say, this didn't happen or This is clearly incorrect, and so we have to change how we view Jesus or how we view the evidence related to him. I'm not saying other people haven't done that. I'm talking about the devotion that I have or other people have that's to him, apart from anything else. What's incorrect? You can disagree. I get that. I get that we don't interpret the evidence the same. Fine. That's not the same as saying it's incorrect. You understand? We can disagree and there can be a... But the, the, there's clearly sufficient evidence to show Jesus really existed, at least compared to, to anyone else who existed from that time or further back. Because the basis that we use for determining someone's existence, right, is the evidence, the witness, the text, other corroborating facts and features of the time. So he fits in that line. Now we talk about the Messiah, the predictions before he came. We have those texts. We have a lot of them. Right? Is, is it proof absolutely that there's no other question this could be? Of course not. It doesn't seem likely to me that that all could be predicted and actually happen the way it did and just be an accident. I don't think that's likely. But it's possible. Still, I, it doesn't mean it was incorrect. I'm not accepting incorrect evidence about Jesus and correct evidence and saying, well... I just think this is more important. This is more important than all that erroneous stuff he did. <laughs> all those sins he committed or whatever, you know, that you might cite, which aren't, aren't there. Okay, now let's compare. Again, to the Watchtower side, just, I'm not trying to pick on them. Again, I, I think I've discussed them in fair terms and ways. I understand the sense in which many of them think and how I think and thought with them. The fact is, we have to accept error, right? It's, it's not the same. It's not the same evidence. Some of it's correct, and that's why most people stay, because that's where they can they they can express their faith in what's correct. That's what they want to do. That's what most people want to do, even Mormons and others. They believe in certain things, and their group or organization, combined with their connections, family, work, it provides them with enough system in which to express what they believe is correct. Now, the question is, are they in danger? Do they know it? And what are they doing about that? Okay, so if we're talking about the Watchtower Society in terms of things like the blood issue and that, well, so the the question is not really hard to answer in the sense that if you feel someone's misled by a teaching, we do what we always do. We share with them certain evidence. We tell them what we think. It's when we start to think they're not reading what we read or hearing what we say and we become so urgent about it that we actually start to take away from our persuasion because we start to seem unreasonable like they don't get it and and i and i believe most often people do it's not that they don't get problems with things like blood for example the watchtower or maybe mormons don't see problems with things like the book of mormon or certain prophets I'm just using them as examples. Or even Catholics, right? 
certain issues with the Pope and other things that you could point to and show it's not consistent with the text uh, in the New Testament. But that's not why they're there. Most people are not in the society, the Watchtower Society, because of the blood issue. They're there because of Jah, because of Jesus, and because of the things they get to do to show their faith in them. And then they look at the other things, or they hear the other things, and they see the other things, and they're there, but then they go back through the list of things that are more important in their view and that they get to do, and the likelihood these other things are going to be an issue for them directly is so small by comparison to what they believe is correct and that will affect them in the future, ultimately, it just doesn't work. And you see, we're thinking, we'll share with them these texts, we'll show them where the, you know, the society was in error, they changed this view, they'll, they'll see it. Well, you know, maybe you might also damage them in ways where, because they're, they're so connected in their spiritual activity with the society, you've now ruined that with pushing them to see the difficulty with blood that they already saw, but just kind of ignored comparatively. Now they do nothing at all. Okay, maybe, maybe that did save them from a problem with the blood issue. Now they're not doing anything in association with the witnesses and Watchtower group. Well, and if you don't believe in God or in Jesus, that's probably okay. Well, what are you going to do if you do believe in God and Jesus and that person becomes worse because you tried to help them about something that is probably not good for them? See how difficult it can get. You become involved in their life in ways that you're going to be responsible for depending on how you act. Right? We can't ignore everything, but how involved are we going to get with people who aren't unable to read like we are. We do want to share with people. People want to share with us. They think we're in a cult, so we listen. All right, so now we're back to evidence. That's the only real way that I can show and say people are in a cult or not. Because if the devotion is not based on the demonstrably best evidence, uniquely associated with something that is different from just someone who makes a prediction or two, that's not enough for people to devote themselves entirely. We have bigger issues, bigger problems. The kinds of things involved with God and Jesus involve life, death, history, all of it. It's worth our attention. Either them or some other group of gods and beings who might help us explain this. But we found it in the biblical text. And we differentiate ourselves from a cult, that is those who would be cult-like or in a cult, a group that is overly devoted to bad evidence, incorrect information. That's the simplest way I can put it because they're believing in people, whether it's Jim Jones, whether it's the Watchtower Society, whether it's a Mormon prophet, whether it's the Pope, because they believe those people are correct. They think those people are who they, they claim they are. And we did it to, did it at one time as well. It takes time. It's not as simple as it is once you've found out, once you've climbed out, once you've figured it out, if you have, right? But even if you think you have, think about how you got to that point. Think of how long it took you to really figure this out and get to a point where you felt you could exist in the right way apart from a group that helped you to learn the right way, but that's now not as good of a group because of these other things. It all goes back to the same thing. Are they committed to the best available evidence? If, they, if you are, if I am, if anyone is, I don't see how you could say they're in a cult. What, a cult of the best evidence? Great. I'm in. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> That's what we believe about Jesus. We believe he's the best evidence of Jah that's ever lived and come to this earth. And what did he say? Did he say, follow me, do what I say? I'll... No, not really. He said, everything I say is from him, the Father. Do what he says. I'll show you how to do it. It's basically what it involved. 
There are a lot of groups today that aren't doing that. They're using Jesus and Jah to get us involved because that's who they know we want. And in many cases, they do help us get to know them. We have to admit that. And they're okay with that and may even believe it too and all the things they do. Again, it gets to perspective. Who's correct? Who's using the evidence? All right, so now let's talk about um, a couple ways that I think you can do that. Three ways. Three ways you can help a person who's not devoted to the best evidence. You can clearly see, okay, I've talked to this person and I've gotten to know them in ways that they've shared their beliefs. And I can see there's some things they believe that are dangerous to them. And they're doing it because someone else is telling them it's correct. But the evidence doesn't support what they're being told. So now you want to make sure they know, right? Who wouldn't want to share information with someone? If you thought they were going to hurt themselves down the road, you didn't talk to them. Okay, so let's say we've identified someone like that. You've checked yourself. You now see that your devotion is to the best available evidence. Not to any person. We listen to people. We learn from them. But they either have the evidence or they don't. It's as simple as that. Think of the first century Christians. I believe they're good examples. All of them. They all pointed to Jesus and then cited evidence that pointed to Jesus. Even someone like Peter, who was confronted by Paul, focused on Jesus. He didn't focus on Paul and get off on him and fight with him. Not at all. They're good examples of people who were devoted to someone who's unusually associated with what I believe you can show and I can show is some of, if not the best historical evidence and information. So using that as a basis for saying whether or not you think someone's in a cult or in a, a group like a cult, it's not always easy to say, right? We've talked about it, different perspectives. People may even see us that way. Either way, we've got someone now, we're pretty sure is in a situation they may not realize, they don't have the best information, and that could hurt them, right? If they're not in danger, you know, it's not our job, really, in my opinion, to go around and force people to view different things, right? You know, if, if someone's not in danger because of a view, it's not a great thing when someone disagrees with us or has a different view. But quite honestly, you know, not everyone has to agree with you or me. And in our group, we just have three things that we require you believe. Jah, Jesus, and how you treat me and you the same way you want to be treated. So, and we, we get away from this type of cultic atmosphere that, that way. Just have fewer beliefs, right? You won't have to enforce as much. But you'll end up enforcing everything because you give people the option of choosing anything and then be judged. It's exactly what we're taught to do. A lot of people today want to be judges. And they create a lot of problems for people who just want one judge. And yet we sometimes are accountable to people. But what's happened is people have taken that base accountability that Jesus talks about in Matthew 18. Where if we have a problem with someone, we go to that person, we talk about it. If we don't resolve it, we go back a couple times with different people. We've taken that scenario and created a system whereby people have authority to really affect and damage a person's spiritual mindset and health and physical health and social um, or connections. So it's gone beyond just this simple, okay, you try to work it out. If you can't work it out after, after a few tries, you move on, right? You treat them like anyone else. You say hi and bye. You work together where you have to, but you don't get closely involved. We don't have to, right? I may disagree with someone who has a different view of things than me. Fine, I'll deal with them like I would want them to deal with me. Our number three belief, golden rule. And then I won't spend a lot of extra time with them when I don't have to. Why? Because we don't have the same goals. We don't have the same interests. So now the question then becomes, are they in danger? Should I be helping them? Or can I just maintain my same interests? That's the issue, right? We sometimes get to know people 
and we think their beliefs are not right. We think they're doing something wrong and we got to help them out. And sometimes we do. But I want you to reflect on you. How were you at that time? And are you really going to help them? Or are you just going to make them question everything? Yeah, maybe that will get some things that they should be getting. But maybe you could take a better shot. Maybe you could approach this a little bit differently. Not everything is perfect, but I'm just suggesting, in this case, three ways. Number one, that you could take a better shot at people. And by shot, I mean figuratively focusing in on and trying to connect with someone to help them. How do you do that? What's the best way to, for best opening for that? Number one, you have to be understanding. You have to have a disposition of understanding. If, if your goal is just to get them to think and question the society and, and hopefully fall out, well, then, you know, you don't probably have to be as understanding. You, you could still be, but you could also just use more direct approaches in ways that just, I think, ultimately would hurt the person more. And so that's why I'm, I'm suggesting this way. When you're understanding to someone, they're less likely to be defensive. See, when, when they don't, when someone doesn't think you understand them, they're, they're just not going to open up to you or feel like it's a situation where they can be um, open to you about such sensitive things like spirituality. This, one of the most identifying things a person has is their sense of spirituality. And so if they don't think, a person doesn't think you will understand them, right away you're at, a, you're at a loss. You're at a limitation, a disadvantage in the sense that if your goal is to help them to keep their sense of devotion to Jesus and John, as in my case, but not to have to have other devotions getting involved beyond, say, a marital or another agreed-upon arrangement, I'm talking about people in a spiritual sense who would want to have you go through them to reach Jesus. Or to be devoted to him, you'd have to be devoted to them or you don't get it. And they won't consider you as having it. And so, to help a person who's in that mindset, you're either going to make them more defensive or not. And understanding is the way to make a person less defensive so that they, in fact, may even feel like you will relate to what they're going through. If they don't think you can relate to what they're going through, it doesn't matter how many facts you can marshal or bring forth. Not, not really. Not in the best way. You might get them to think about something, but ultimately, are you trying to just get them and get them out of the society, or are you trying to help them out of maybe a group like the society? Maybe they don't need help out of the society. I say the society because obviously I believe a lot of people are well-meaning in the society, and want to worship Jah and G and follow Jesus and do the right things, but they're doing so in association with the society in ways I don't believe they have to in order to do the things that are pleasing to Jah and Jesus. Now, they think they do, some of them, okay? So just because I don't believe you do, that doesn't delegitimize overall that they believe they do. They believe the society has been appointed and should be followed in these ways. And it's not for no reason. Even if the reasons are flawed in our view, and, and that's enough, right? Because again, what's the difference between someone you'd consider as part of a cult or cult-like group and those who aren't? Are they devoted to the best evidence, the best reasons? If not, then they're devoted to something that's demonstrably or knowably wrong. And that's where there's a problem. That's why we keep our things to three, right? Our three beliefs. So it doesn't really matter really what else we might be wrong on because we're not making issues out of them. We're focused on the three. But other groups have a lot more than three. And if the devotion is equal across the board, and if any of those things are wrong, then I believe there's cause for concern. Now, that again, if, if people in the Watchtower Society don't believe there's concern enough, or that comparatively, while there may be some concerns, there's not enough to leave the society in that sense. It's as far as serving Jaws concerned. 
It could be the same with a Catholic or a Mormon or anyone else, really, or even a Protestant who may be overly devoted to creeds or councils and scholars whom they really elevated and put on a pedestal where they're not just teachers anymore. You know, I mean, they're pretty much going to go with what they say no matter what. So you can get different degrees of cultic behavior in these different groups. But if you're understanding, you will be more likely to lower the defense of the person and hopefully get them to think, this person might be able to relate to me. Because if they're really concerned about the things you're concerned about, right? Most people know about the issues and some people need to hear, but over time, most people are, are become aware of their issues. It's just a question of timing. You know, are they, are they concerned enough? And is it the right time to open up to the right person so that they don't just leave a group or fall out of a group? They actually keep doing the things that brought them to the group which are usually more than the problems or other than the problems that people are talking about, right? Most people identify, for example, the society as unique in the sense that they follow them because of, of certain things that they accept in association with them that are very important in a spiritual sense. And so by comparison, the flaws or problems, it's not that they're unaware, it's just they're not an issue enough to set aside these other things that are more important. And so a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll attack these more important things, get them not to believe in God, and then by, by association, then they'll stop them associating with the society. That's not our goal. <laughs> That's not our goal. I don't. Maybe you'll be, be better off. I don't know. But my goal is never to do something that would disconnect you from God, or from belief in Jesus. Why? That would be opposite of what <laughs> I'm trying to accomplish because the best evidence is there. The best evidence is for Jah as God, historically, scientifically, and Jesus as the one he sent forth in association with all these other things and people and nations and events. So I want them, I want as many as possible to believe in that evidence or show me where I'm wrong, right? Because <laughs> if I'm wrong, then I have to reevaluate because I don't want to be devoted to what's wrong, demonstrably. It's not just that people don't agree or they think I'm wrong, right? That's different. The society has done things they've changed, for example. Catholics have changed over time, their beliefs, the popes and different things. And so when they say the devotion must in some sense go through their representatives, who have been wrong. Well, right away, by comparison, you know they're not the best option because there's nothing at all wrong with Jesus, right? It, you can, you get it all by just going right to him, which is what all of the New Testament writers try to get us to do. So while other people may use different groups, look to different people, once their devotion becomes such that their looking to what they say regardless of whether it's correct because of the totality of things that they believe in association with that person or group well that's a concern right because they're willing to accept what's demonstrably incorrect for these other reasons and the only reason that would be acceptable is if there was not another option Right? If there was no other way to accept all the good things without accepting what's obviously wrong, then it makes sense. I go with the best group, right? Which group has the best stuff, the, the best package? Okay, I see it's got some wrong stuff. What's, who's got the best package? Well, you know, you can make it look more or less like one group or another, depending on which text you quote. <laughs> But that's what's happening. They're taking a package. And they're not, they're not aware. And this is why you have to be understanding. This is why I make a difference between how you should approach people and how others do who don't try to maintain their belief in God. They're buying into a package and they don't think there's another option. And the option that may be there, that is just do the things on your own, kind of like maybe I or you started to do at one point, is just so difficult from the start 
by comparison with this group that's already going, has all these people, all these connections, is it really worth it to just start on my own and just talk about what I believe and not get involved in these other things? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it hard? Very difficult. Very difficult for a time. Now, that's why number two, number one way to help people in religious cults or cult-like groups, if that's how you see them and there's legitimate devotion to something that's incorrect and could damage them, patience. You have to be patient. Understanding and patience really go hand in hand, right? Unless your understanding is so automatic, so immediate, that there's not a nest it's not necessary for um, anything to endure in order to deal with something that's not usually the case when it comes to people who have grown up in or learned so much about one organization or individual and over time come to believe in him through circumstances where faith may be tested this is why i said earlier you have to look back at yourself maybe you're someone who was a part of one of these groups and you just kind of stop believing because of things that were incorrect and you didn't really lose your faith you just don't have it active yet but then maybe you're a person who was abused by one of these groups right i mean so you could if you if you're someone let's say um someone like barbara anderson whom i don't know very well i am connected with on facebook and i've had, had a few brief conversations she seems like a nice person. I know she's become very active against the society in ways that have to do with her knowledge and experience with um, potential abuse. And many of us know that the society has issues with their organizational structure, with, which tends to lend itself to certain types of um, abuses. That doesn't mean that the society necessarily intentionally promotes abuse. There's some issues with certain things. That I think people like Barbara are into, but uh, my point is, see, there's different individuals who, because of their contact with these groups, come away more or less with their faith or are just so affected by what they experienced in the group that that's really what they pursue. So when it comes to you, when it comes to, if you're like me, Someone who's trying to do the best they can to follow what we accept as legitimate Christianity from the earliest sources we have without getting you know, caught up into endless debate or distracted by people who require things we don't think are necessary to believe in order to worship God and follow Jesus. If the goal is to keep people going like that, then regardless of whether you've been affected um, experientially through some form of abuse or knowledge of abuse, or whether you've just fallen away, and now you kind of are becoming active and you know the things that maybe people are dealing with and you want to help, be understanding, be patient. These things are not easy. Now, I bring up people like Barbara or others Again, I'm not trying to ratify everything any individual does. I'm using examples. And from what I know, she seems like she's concerned enough about some issues, potential abuse in the society, to speak out about them. So she's going to have a different mindset toward people who are affected uh, by some of the things that she has direct knowledge about, right? I don't really know anyone directly. Um who was, I do know people who have been directly affected by things like the blood issue and stuff, but I do, I, not in the, in, I know people who have been abused, but by people in the society, I don't really, can't recall any direct experience with that. So my motivation is a little bit different. I look at people in the society and the society uh, as well, more or less as a group that is um, in some respects trying to do the best they can, but in other ways is, is caught following their own ways to a point where, there are going to be people who are drawn to them because of the good things they do. But 
by, by comparison, are going to ignore some of the bad things that, that are associated with them. And so this is where, as a Christian, you become concerned because we like it when people show interest. We want people expressing a desire to believe in God and Jesus. But the problem we have is that many groups are adding things to that worship that complicate it for um, those who are aware of the abuses or potential abuses. So if that's your situation, if you're dealing with an organization or group, regardless of whether you believe they have comparatively more good than bad, but if you still think there are issues and there are people that, that and if you're more like me where you can understand why people belong to groups like, like the society, but that ultimately they may cause you more harm than good, but I would only try to approach a person like that if I felt I could keep their faith going in the things that I think are correct that the society promotes. So again, if a person's devoted to what's demonstrably wrong, that's a concern. How big of a concern? Well, that's not always easy to say. You ask someone like Barbara, she's going to tell you it's a massive concern. <laughs> You ask someone who just has kind of fallen away because, you know, it's too many meetings and, you know, you don't like speaking and they require you to give talks. Well, you're probably not going to be as concerned. All right. Well, either way, I'm asking you to try these three things, two of which I've given you already. Understanding. Patience. Number three. Strength. You have to be strong. And I use strength here because we already know about things like love. We're not, you know, this isn't like a, 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 ba a review of very basic stuff. I'm giving you kind of a, a unique perspective on several things that I've found to be helpful when dealing with cults and people in cults or in cult-like groups in these ways. And so we've talked about what it means to be in a cult. What is a cult? Why, how can we show we're not in a cult and yet other people are in a cult, right? And then I highlighted how when we're convinced we're not in a cult and we've shown through our own review of our beliefs that our devotion is really to the best available evidence to know obvious errors. Once we've done that and we're in a condition where we can approach people because you have to, have the, you have to know what you're doing. What are you trying to help them become? Well, you should be helping them become like you. And so first, you have to focus on you. Are your beliefs set right? Or are you just going to start requiring from people you're trying to help other things that aren't necessarily right? Maybe you think they are. Well, that's what they're doing, you see? So that's why you have to review. What is it you require of yourself? What is it you believe they need to do? And are you prepared to show that? Because you're basically going to approach someone you think's in, a, in a, a situation like in a cult from the perspective that they're not aware of errors they have yet. So first, are you aware of any errors you may have? Because if they are and you're not and you try to help them, right? This is why Trinitarians are often very ineffective with people like those in the Watchtower. Because the Trinitarians present them with an argument based on things like the Trinity. And that then raises the level of belief in, in people who accept non-Trinitarian views of God like the Watchtower. And so now the Trinitarian doesn't realize it. They're putting them in a position where they're building their faith. And that's a good thing in one way, but they're doing it in association with the group that may have other things that they're not focused on that'll hurt the faith they're building later on. And this is the danger we have because, you know, all that good could go out the window if the problems aren't addressed at some point the right way. Understanding patience takes time. It's not easy. You've got to be understanding so they relate to you and sense you'll understand where they're coming from. You have to have patience, right? Who among us didn't take time before we understood certain things better? That's how you should treat other people. Be strong. It's going to require you to actually not act as urgent as you may feel like being because of the difficulty involved, right? Like I said, you may have someone 
who's against things like you know pedophilia, sexual abuse, and they had direct, excuse me, um, experience with certain problems in groups that involved this kind of abuse. Well, it, they're going to have to be strong so they they don't overreact in their sense of of urgency. And I'm, I'm not talking about hesitating <laughs> in any correct way. You should always report abuse and act appropriately but, but i'm talking about people who who aren't maybe being abused but who are in a group or with those who facilitate abuse and you're trying to help them see something and you're affected by the abuse you know happens and so your sense of urgency is high and theirs isn't because they've not been affected by it you will seem a little bit un, un irrational to them and it will it will it could have the counter effect of justifying in their mind that the society is more rational than you or that the other group, the Pope, the Catholics, they're just more rational than you. Your, your urgency might suggest a quality or a lack of dependence. And we all have to struggle with that because who among us who doesn't feel urgent, an urgent need doesn't get a little excited, right? That's why I'm mentioning it among the three you got to be strong. This is not easy. It is not easy to approach someone who may be in a difficult spot, but who at the same time is doing other things that you believe are right and even uniquely correct, right? Like faith. So you shouldn't approach these things casualty for sure. You shouldn't just randomly try to throw in a fact on someone that you learned and I hope that dissuades them from believing. I guess if you're just an atheist and you don't care or someone else who doesn't care about the effect that, un, that, that unhinging a person's faith could do, it's like surgery. you got to be careful. You, you can't just rush in there and start cutting. Otherwise, you might damage a person more than you're helping them. And then what? You're going to be responsible for that because you didn't take the time to think a little bit better about how to act? And how to talk to them. I'm not saying we're responsible or anyone's responsible for the decision someone ultimately makes. Because I don't believe that's the case. But we can make it easier, right? We can make it easier or more or more difficult. I say we make it easier as, as often as we can. It'll be difficult at times. That's, that's a fact. Uh, but so... And there's a question that ties into this that Everett Commodore has asked, and that is the um, the common view of Catholics that Peter is um, well, you know, that as Jesus said, the rock. In in one sense, he played off his name, and said, "It's on this rock that I'll build my church." And then the the keys were given to um, Peter and those I believe present to bind and loose things on heaven and on earth. And I believe we all have that ability. And if we show enough faith to bind and loose things, more or less, right? What did Jesus say when he was talking to his disciples and they were help, They were trying to exercise the demon? And some of them were talking about a demon that they couldn't get out. And what did Jesus say? He said, well, this kind can only be brought up by prayer, which involves faith, but a more direct connection to John that way. So there's different degrees in which people bind and loose things depending on their faith and the degree of prayer, uh, the, the, the prayer that they make at the time that the need is there. Sometimes prayers are answered immediately, right? Just like in Daniel, we read, Daniel, from the moment your prayer went up, word went out. So I think all of us who have faith enough to believe in John Jesus and confess them are able to bind and loose things on heaven and earth. Well, let's talk just about the rock thing for a moment and the Catholic Church. So... Um, so Peter was a Christian in the New Testament, right? And if we're going to accept the text where it's where Jesus says, "You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church," I've never seen a connection between that text and legitimacy with the Catholic Church, which came about hundreds of years later. And even if they want to um, consider it. As Peter being in Rome, they believe Peter was in Rome and so effectively established the church at that time. Well, but 
the church at that time wasn't really established, especially not in Rome, right? You had different Roman emperors who came and who abused the Christians. You had, um, obviously, Nero, who set fire to Christians in the theater. So there wasn't this church in Rome where the Romans were tolerating the church at that time. Even if you look in the letter uh, from Pliny to Trajan, right? I mean, what, what does that indicate in, at the uh, start of the second century? That, that the Christians were pretty much persecuted for believing anything that would be contrary to Roman religion. So, unfortunately, uh, well, for Catholics, that I just that I've never seen the connection between the text in the New Testament, where Peter's, in a sense, viewed as the rock on which the church is built, as one of Jesus' earliest disciples. And of course, as we know, the twelve um, apostles of Jesus are treated especially in this, in these ways. And we know Jesus is the cornerstone. But I don't have a problem with viewing Peter as one of the stones foundation on which um, the Christian congregation was built. He was active. He helped to spread the great message. But it, it doesn't establish a Roman Catholic religion. Now, all it would do is show that Peter is, an involved, is a pillar, like Revelation 3.12 talks, uh, talks about, I believe. Revelation 3. Pillar in the temple of uh, Jesus God. Literally, in the sense that he's active in the associated uh, supporting the Christian um, congregation, which is what Peter said. He was going to build it on him or build it on him in a play on words that could be him. But that would just then show that the things in his letters should be looked to as correct. And they don't support the Catholic view, um, not the Roman Catholic view. And we know that the Roman Catholic Church really cannot establish itself um, as early back as Peter. As I just said, the first century went through <laughs> several periods where the Christians were persecuted, the Jews were destroyed in 70. The Christians weren't even considered anything at that point unless they were, like in Nero's day, a, a nuisance sect religion that they could use um, for their own ends. So I don't see any establishment by Peter or by anyone, even Paul, of an official church that just kept going in Rome. It appears that there were different groups of Christians in Rome at different times, depending on the persecution going on. And this kept going through uh, many decades, even centuries, uh, through to the 3rd and 4th centuries where it became less common and the church was more established as part of the state religion. But that's totally different from the Roman religion and government and nation that's in the 1st century and from in the 2nd century for the most part. So I just don't see any establishment of a Roman church before the mid-2nd century if you're going to really try to, to build it up in some way. I don't see it as coming from Peter. So And that wouldn't establish the Catholics in terms of being able to teach anything they want anyway, would it? We get back to the same basis for establishing, are we in a cult? Or are you in a cult? And I say, the only way to effectively do that is to ask yourself first, what are you devoted to and why? If after going through that examination, you can, you can convince yourself without lying, <laughs> not easy, that your beliefs are based on evidence that is not commingled with factual error. It can be things that maybe you can't establish 100%, right? We can't establish we're going to be alive when we go and drive today. But more often than not, more likely than not, we're usually alive when we go out and drive each day. But if we knew that when we were going to go out and drive today, we knew we were going to get into an accident, would you go? You didn't know where it was. You didn't know how severe. Would you still go? Would you still have as much faith to go out and drive knowing that people die every day? Many people. And you're one of the people out driving that day. But let's say you knew for sure that day you chose to drive, you were going to have an accident. Would you go? You didn't know what kind or how severe. You just knew that, that one day 
If you go out and drive, you will have an accident. Would you go? Or would you stay in, let that day pass, then go? When there wasn't so much certainty, you would have an accident. I, I say you wouldn't, you wouldn't go, right? Why not wait till the next day when you know there's not a for sure accident, right? Maybe we'll have an accident like any other day. But if there's a for sure accident waiting for us in that day, no way. No way. So if you know for sure you have an accident in your faith, you need to take care of it. Before you go and help other people, you take the own, the little, the big piece of wood out of your eye, you'll see clearly how to get the small piece out of the other people. We start with ourselves. Okay, now we've done that. Fine. Is the person you're concerned about clearly believing and devoted to something that is for sure, demonstrably wrong? If so, and it will damage them by believing and being devoted to it, I recommend you show understanding, patience, and be strong because it's going to take time. And you're going to have to develop a relationship with the person if you really want to help them in ways that allow them to feel they can relate to you and that you'll really help them, and hopefully you will too, because by help, I mean you help people who are in trouble maintain their faith in things that are not trouble. And you carefully, like a surgeon or anyone who's concerned about something would be, and you handle it the right way and you get rid of the problem. And I suggest understanding patience and being strong. Identifying the wrong. That's the way you do it. What do you do when you're going into surgery or when someone's going into surgery to deal with the problem? They get it out. They deal with the condition. They don't kill the whole body, right? We take care. We preserve the body. And we're careful just to operate on the part that needs help. That's how I think we should be. And so if we do that and we concentrate first on ourselves so we're ready to deal with these other things, just like Jesus said, beam out of your eye. Then you can see the splinter in the other person. Show patience, understanding, and be strong. Look for the error. What's the issue? Is it demonstrably false? Or do you just disagree? Sometimes it's not going to be easy, right? The Catholics may say it's proof. Peter's the rock, and he's the first, first pope. And you know, even though I don't think they have the facts, they just they believe it. So then that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to show, like I did, that there's really no connection between a church in Rome and Peter, or between the first century even and the Christian activity then, or even the first part of the second century. There's no indication that there was a church in Rome allowed and existing and, and that would provide the basis historically for Roman Catholic lineage. But, or you could talk about other things, right? Where we're not supposed to call the people our father, where we're not supposed to forbid people to marry. There's different things you could use to, to, to ask yourself, is this view correct? But now they may have a, a comeback. See, don't, don't think they haven't, or people who you're concerned about, haven't thought about any of these things, right? They just believe they have the authority. They believe they are correct. Catholics believe their history of the Pope and their lineage establishes them to be able to interpret these texts differently. The Watchtower Society believes it has been uniquely appointed in ways that a lot of other people believe and accept. And so they are not going to allow problems to override that acceptance. It's more important. It's more clear to them. So the only real way you're going to be able to help them, and by help I mean maintain their faith in the right things, get rid of the problem, is to be patient, show understanding, and be strong, right? We don't back away. We have to know the problem, but we wait. We look for the right opening. We're surgeons. We've got to operate under the right conditions. We don't want to kill the body. We just want to deal and try to help a part of it get better. And if by trying to help one small part of it get better, you kill the whole thing or make it more worse, well, you've got more work to do. 
So try not to give yourself more work to do. Try to keep their faith intact. Try to get them to think about certain things that are not quite necessary. And most important of all, in, in addition, by the way you show patience, understanding, and being strong is by showing them the right way to do the things that they want to do, but without having to do the other stuff, right? When other people start to see that there's another option, right? That, that this isn't the only, this isn't the best package. They don't have to take the best of the worst. Or the worst of the bad. You know what I mean, right? So many people are choosing these groups or people to believe in because even though they see the errors, it's not always they don't see the error. Most people see the errors or are aware of some errors. They're just, it's the best package. And so if you know that going in, if you already know they're looking at it as the best package, all right, patience, understanding, be strong. Try to get them to see there's some issue there because you don't want them to get hurt by the thing that's wrong, right? But show them the right package. Show them, hey, you know, all that stuff, worshiping Jah, following Jesus, talking to other people, you absolutely can do it. People are doing it. It was more difficult for me to do. It was more difficult for other people to do. It'll be more difficult for them to do. But it'll be better. In the long run, they'll be healthier. And there won't be this lingering danger there. It might kill them.